if Mr. Trump would take questions on this topic on December 15th when he said he was going to explain how he was going to wall off his global business empire from the White House. But as Christina just said, that date has been put off until next month. President-elect Trump has not held a press conference in 139 days. That was the day, of course, that he told Russia to hack Hillary Clinton's email servers. He said he was saying so jokingly. In the modern era, no president-elect has ever gone this long without taking questions from reporters in such a setting after winning the White House. Let's bring in our political panel, Maggie Haberman, White House correspondent for The New York Times, and Philip Bump, a uh, political reporter uh, for, wa for The Washington Post. Uh, thank you both uh, for being here. So, Maggie, do you think it's possible that President-elect Trump, President Trump, will never do a press conference? Newt Gingrich has suggested that that's what he thinks should happen. I think any assumption that what we know of in the White House is just going to continue uh, is an erroneous one. I think that it, there might be certain traditions that hold. I suspect there will be some form of a daily briefing. They are looking at traditional titles, you know, communications director of some kind, press secretary. But I do think it is possible that you will see uh, the president, once he's president, just tweet out his thoughts uh, or give one-off interviews uh, and make his thoughts known that way. Um, his press conferences, as you know, used to get very contentious sometimes. Uh, he would uh, shoot down questions or tell people to sit down when he didn't like them. Um, he's very, very good at controlling the information flow right now, but it is, it is disturbing in terms of uh, access uh, to a free press. Well, because there are questions to yeah. ask. You sure. know, and Philip, one, yeah. of the thing, one of the things I think that, that President-elect Trump doesn't not necessarily quite understand is that this whole conflict of interest thing, this actually, if he actually did the responsible thing that the Wall Street Journal and, and others, conservative media, have suggested he need to do, liquidate his assets or put it in a blind trust or whatever, that actually would help him with his presidency. I don't think he thinks that, though. No, I mean, pretty clearly. I mean, he, I mean, this is a guy who is still making the transition, I think, mentally into being a politician, right? I mean, he's he, he prides himself on not being a politician. I mean, once you're president elected of the United States, it's kind of hard to, to uh, uh, not consider yourself a politician. But I think that fundamentally, he is very good, too, at being reactive in the moment to whatever it is he wants to deal with, but not good at thinking longer term about what it is he should be doing, right? I think that he doesn't want to have a press conference in part because there are a lot of questions that are floating out right at this moment that he probably doesn't really want to deal with beyond sending out a tweet or two and I'm not sure he really gets that where he's going to be four years from now assuming he serves out his full term is a very different place than where he is right now and that has different implications for his business something else that that uh, seems to be a, a discrepancy between the president-elect and almost everybody else including people in his party uh, has to do with Russia and the intelligence community suggesting that they have a pretty high degree of confidence that Russia was behind uh, the hacks listen to Kellyanne Conway uh, talking to Anderson Cooper last night about this issue. And this smells like politics, plain and simple. We in, in the Trump presidency do not want foreign governments interfering in our elections. That's very clear. We also don't want we don't want intelligence interfering interfering in our politics, but we certainly don't want what we have now, which is politics interfering in our intelligence. Now, it's a bipartisan group of senators who are calling for an investigation. Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, majority leader. You just heard Bob Corker on the show saying the Foreign Relations Committee is going to be conducting a review. They take this very seriously. They think it's real. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is uh, basically seen as questionable uh, for most uh, Republicans and Democrats in Congress as to why you would say, object to an investigation into whether a foreign power was trying some uh, espionage role in an American election. Um, there's two separate issues. One is whether it was Russia, which Trump has suggested he doesn't accept, and then there's what the goal was of what they were trying to do. And both of those questions can be solved with an investigation. I think it'll be interesting to see if Trump's posture on this changes once he is president, uh, actually sworn in. We'll see. And the other thing, Philip, about this issue is then there's this third conclusion, uh, which is, did it have, did it make a difference? And that is almost, you can't really even measure that. I mean, that's just somebody's opinion. Okay. Who knows? And I, it seems to me that, that, that Mr. Trump might be concerned about that, as right. if that makes it illegitimate. Right. But I, you hear very few Democratic politicians even talking about whether or not it actually made a difference. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that part of this, too, I mean, much less the inauguration on January 20th, I think he also wants to get past this electoral vote and make sure all of those ducks are in a row uh, before he starts worrying about the role that Russia played. I mean, look, we're talking about 80,000 votes in three states, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and uh, Michigan. That's why Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States. A lot of things could have swung those 80,000 votes. It could have been a particular thing released by WikiLeaks. It could have been a particular ad that uh, Hillary Clinton didn't run. 
All sorts of things can be blamed for that, including this if people choose to do so. And I think that is part of the reason why the Trump campaign consistently, our transition team, it consistently has tried to argue that they have a bigger mandate than they actually have. Although, I mean, but you could say, sure, maybe Russia had some sort of impact, but Hillary Clinton didn't go to Wisconsin. Right after the conventions. I mean, there's any number of things that could have made a difference. Right. Uh, the Times has a big story on this up right now and makes the point that, uh, you know, there are, are several factors that went into this loss. It's pretty hard to isolate and, as you say, measure any single one. We will never know what the impact is, but uh, it doesn't actually have to be whether there was an impact in the election to be concerned about the fact this could have happened at all. And I think that's the argument you hear from people who say there should be a probe. The Clinton campaign also has not really, as you noted, talked about this as a, as a major cause, at least not in uh, recent weeks, they have focused very much on the letter from James Comey uh, right. about the email server uh, in the final 10 days of the election, and they've been laser focused on that. There are, as you say, a number of other reasons, a lot of them uh, going back to 2013 when she gave paid speeches at Goldman Sachs. You add all of this up, uh, you know, not having staff in Wisconsin or Michigan to enough degree, not doing ads uh, that were more positive about her, not having a focused enough economic message. There's a lot of reasons. Although John Podesta, the Clinton campaign chairman, is behind this uh, move right now to try to get an intelligence briefing to electors before they formally vote on uh, making Donald Trump the 45th presidency of the United States. That, that seems odd. What's going on behind there? Uh, it's a great question, and Maggie may actually be able to speak to this better than I can. But, you know, I mean, it, it just seems to me that this is an issue where there is a question about the extent to which a foreign power played a role in an American election. And I think John Podesta is someone who would want to have that sussed out to some extent, although... There is a political trickiness to it that you raise, which I don't think does the Clinton team any good, and especially in this moment when there's a lot of attention being paid to what Trump is doing, their adversaries, what Trump is doing, it's a weird thing for him to step out in front of it. They want to record, I think, that this was an extraordinary event uh, in the history of this country's elections, and it was, uh, to have espionage conducted at this level. Um, John Podesta is about as high as you can go without Hillary Clinton herself saying right. it, or Barack Obama saying it. That would be very risky, because there is not a whole a lot of uh, chance of this succeeding, that it's going to overthrow uh, the election and have the electors go against Donald Trump. I right. think the tricky thing, too, in this Podesta uh, statement that they put out and calling uh, for this uh, uh, declassifying of information is the media didn't cover this enough. There, I don't think there was anybody who didn't know um, about these hacks or about the uh, allegations that it was Russia. There was a lot of coverage. The morning after the DNC hack, uh, the morning of the convention starting State of the Union, Robbie Mook, the campaign manager yeah. for Hillary Clinton, on State of the Union, yeah. saying it was Russia. That's right. From then on, it was all Russia. It was all That's Russia right. all the time. Maggie Phil, thank you so thank you. much.